There we go. So we have the recording started. And let's see, I am going to try really quick to see if I can make this live on, on Facebook or not. I should have done that first, but nope, it's not going to let me. So I'm not going to mess with it. OK. So let's see. I'm going to, I guess, get started, just like dive right in, because why not? Um, and I have a little slide on here with some information on like how to ask questions and stuff. So that's why I'll do it this way. Anna, I know you're listening. You don't have to undo your um, camera or your microphone or unmute or anything. But can you just kind of keep track of questions in case I miss any? OK. Here we go. I guess I should share my screen first. That would probably help. Here we go. OK. Can everyone see that? Just give me a thumbs up if you're good. OK. So what we're going to talk about today is um, marketing, which is basically what I told you we'd be talking about. And I thought that we could start this off um, with this first kind of round of, yeah, me doing some mentoring on here with diving into an overview of marketing and how that looks, as well as how you can get out there and do some campaigns <clears throat> or create marketing campaigns and marketing plans, I should say. But before we do that, um, I gave an overestimate on this. Okay, wait, actually, let me go back. Um, there's a quick reminder, keep yourself muted, please. Um, like Melissa was saying, if your dogs are gonna be in the background being wild or if you're doing dishes or like whatever, just try and keep yourself muted. But if you do want to jump in and ask a question, you absolutely can. Um, because I'm sharing my screen, I'm not able to see everyone's faces. So it's hard for me to see if you're raising your hand like this. Um, so that's why if you need to, you can unmute and just say, hey, Ash, and jump in if you need to <clears throat> at you know a nice time if possible. Otherwise, you can write questions in the chat or use the um, reaction button thing and raise your hand that way. And I'll try and get to you as soon as I can. What I will do is I will be making sure to every little bit here, um, check in on the chat and make sure that I get to the questions that might have come through as I'm talking. Um, I have that class will take about 120 minutes. I'm overestimating, just wanted to give some cushion. If you need to jump in and jump out or whatever, that's fine. Like I said, it will be recorded. So I'll be able to email you the playback of this and you can can watch it or you can stick around. And if you want to watch it over and over again, you absolutely can. Uh, because I know sometimes it um, is hard to absorb information on one go. So it might be good to go back th through at some point. The other thing you can do is take notes. Feel free to take notes. And yeah, if you have any questions, again, ask in the chat. You can put it in all caps. We know you, you're you not yelling. If you, if you want to do all caps, you can. Um, that way, Anna and I make sure we get the question. And um, yeah, like I said, you can use the raising hand uh, reaction, or you can just unmute yourself if it seems like a good time and jump in. Um, and I'll give little points here and there. So what we have on the agenda here, that's where we're going to be diving into marketing. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to keep it brief because, you know, it's not all about me. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you about the core components of marketing, how marketing can help you, um, the three phases of marketing, as well as the marketing mix, digital versus and traditional marketing, as well as marketing plans and campaigns. And then I'll open it up to Q&A. Um, I do have some questions that I pulled from people in the Facebook group ha who had written as comments. Um, so I'm going to address those questions first. But if you have any questions, like I said, throughout, you can write them in the chat or you can raise your hand, unmute, et cetera. Or if you want, you can save it till the end. Either way is absolutely fine with me. OK, so this is me. Um, I thought this picture was really appropriate <laughs> because this was taken at um, a DFP retreat. We used to do DFP retreats quite often pre-COVID. Um, we need to get back into doing them now that COVID's, um, you know, not 
locking us all into place. But this was at a DFP retreat. And one thing that we do at our retreats is we sing a lot of karaoke. And so I thought this uh, photo of me was really appropriate because it's just ridiculous and gives a little bit of my personality. So about me, I'm the founder of Documentary Family Photographers Worldwide, um, the community, and uh, we have educational resources for documentary family photographers or documentary photographers, doesn't necessarily have to be family. Um, and we also have a membership with a directory listing, as well as other member perks and exhibits and um, community and connection and all sorts of things like that. I'm also a photographer. I've been a photographer for, God, I don't know how many years now I'm trying to count, more than 10 years. I don't even know what year we're in at this point. Um, and I mostly photograph, uh, well, I was photographing a lot of family and actually in more recent years, the last couple of years, I have changed gears and am photo photographing a lot more birth um, as well as street photography, um, which has always been my favorite thing to photograph. So um, I like to do a lot of kind of like personal projects and uh, look at the way humanity works in different cultures and try and find um, the similarities as well as differences in that through street photography. Um, in addition to that, I'm a mentor. Um, I've had, I don't know how many hundreds of students at this point, but I've had a lot um, and it's something I really, really enjoy doing and teaching has been um, kind of another just creative outlet for me. But in addition to that, it really allows me to connect with people. Um, I'm sure as you all know, um, being a photographer, especially if you're in business, it can feel quite isolating. And so this has really, uh, being a mentor has given me a chance to stay connected with people and not feel like I'm so alone, um, you know, doing this thing. So I have here my little blurb of what I do, and that's that I empower photographers and creatives to create impact with their art and business to own their story and to help them identify their own version of success. I focus, focus on personalized mentoring experiences and badass communi communities that dive deep into the heart of who they are, enabling them to expand on their vision, create plans, and kick some major ass. So um, the one thing I wanted to put, point out here was the identifying their own version of success. And I'm pointing this out in particular right now because um, as I go through this marketing information, I think it's really important to mention that um, I do not, as a mentor, I am very against this idea that one size fits all and that there's only one way of doing things in order to be successful. Um, I think that everyone has different types of lifestyles and different ways of working. And some ways that work for me might not work for you. And some um, things might surprise you that actually, you know, you're, if you put into action, they will work for you. So I don't, yeah, I don't like this, putting out this idea that, oh, if you do these exact things, you're going to create success. The most, um, I, I think the, the most uh, important thing that you can do in order for success is to continue to be consistent in whatever it is you're doing and however it is you're showing up and you get to decide what consistent means. So I know for me, um, I'm someone who has to work in bursts. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but I'm one of those people who needs a lot of downtime after I photographed a family or a birth or um something like that. So I make sure to work that into my turnaround time, for example, for my clients so that they know to expect, hey, I'm not getting my photos in a week from now. It's going to be more like two months from now um, because I need that time to recuperate after having a session and um, I need time to sit on the photos. I need time to go through them. I need time to um, pretend that I don't need to work for a little bit and then I can go back to the photos and start editing them and deliver it. And as long as I communicate that with my clients, it's been absolutely fine. So I just wanted to give an example of that. Um, I often joke that like if I, I'm kind of a hot mess and so if I can have a, um, a great business and um, earn money and do all the things I need to do, then I think pretty much anybody could <laughs> because yeah, I'm not the most, um, you know, organized person in the world. Um, I'm organized chaos, I would say. Um, 
<laughs> I know that I've seen some people are saying that resonates with them. So good. <laughs> so some ways that um, you can work with me in the future or anytime, you can always reach out to me, ask questions um, through messenger or email. But I do have a year long program that is coming up. It is starting at the end of this month. So just in a couple weeks here. Um, it's a year long program with Jenna Schuldeis. I'm not sure if you know her, but you absolutely should. She's an amazing photographer and mentor. And she's also the founder of the Documentary Family Photography Awards. Um, check out her work if you haven't seen it. It's quite incredible. And she's one of my favorite photographers to ever exist and favorite people. Um, so her and I are doing a year long program together. It's called No More Effing Around. Um, and it's where we take you from um, basically creating a whole new portfolio, revamping your portfolio, sending you out on um, assignments and all that good stuff, in addition to making sure every single part of your business is where it needs to be. So going, starting with mindset on through to branding and workflow and pricing and sales and um, marketing and campaigns and customer service and anything and everything in between. There's a reason it takes a year because, and that's because it's really to get your shit together. So um, that's that. And then I also do one-on-one -on -one mentoring as well as this year, I'm going to be offering small group mentoring. And by that, I mean, if you can find like a couple other photographers that you want to be in a group to mentor with, we can do that. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about me. I'm going to show you about uh, no more effing around. Um, it's all the information you can find about it is here at the bottom. Um, documentary or sorry, dfpeducation.com backslash an MFA minus year minus long minus mentoring. Um, you can also just go to dfpeducation.com and it'll show you to that link. But an overview of that is we have weekly groom groom. <laughs> weekly group Zoom lessons and discussions, monthly one-on-ones, accountability groups, and then tons of support and heaps of fun. And like I said, you can find out more about the program via that link. Um, yeah, so, and this is what we do in it. Basically, we um, help you with um, providing you a new mindset and belief system about your work, your photography, and your business. Um, we help you to be courageous in the way you photograph and see the world. You put your best work uh, out and your true voice in front of people who will be drawn in based on your unique perspective. You attract clients, editors, opportunities, et cetera, by showing up. And then it creates a ripple effects of referrals, testimonials, exhibits, awards, jobs, et cetera. So we've had a lot of success with this program, as have our students. Um, right now, we're having 500 euro off registration. So just want to throw that out there really quick. Okay. So moving on, um, we're going to get right into marketing. So sorry, I just have to move you all really quick because my Zoom has your faces covering my, my, my screen here. So what is marketing? Um, there's a lot, obviously, a ton of different definitions of marketing. The biggest one that um, is helpful for, or the best way for me to think of marketing is to get people to know you, like you, and trust you. And so that's what we're going to be talking a lot about today. Um, and so the bottom line is marketing is the strategy that, you're, you, that you use for getting your target market to know you, like you, and trust you enough to become a client so you can solve their problems and meet their needs. Um, when we talk about solving their problems and meeting their needs, I know that this is something that comes up a lot in uh, marketing classes that you hear, oh, what problem are you solving? And this is a really difficult question to answer, right? Because there's no, again, one size fit all. And you ideally should be solving a different problem than uh, everybody else, which is really difficult to figure out and pinpoint what that's going to be. So just another kind of way to think about this and not get caught up on, okay, what is the problem I'm solving is how are you meeting their needs? Or my favorite way to think of it is what impact are you having on your client? Um, and the way you start thinking about this is by looking at what ideally would you like your clients to see in your photographs of themselves when they see the photos for the first time? What do you want them to feel? And how can you communicate that to them? So um, when we talk about this, a lot of times we'll see this um, 
the phrase is like, these photos will mean everything generations from now, or um, you'll enjoy these for years to come. And those statements are both true. However, I want you to really focus on figuring out what impact you have on them in the moment they first see the photos that you've made of them. So not in the future, the future is also important, but I think the easiest thing to sell to clients and sell, I know sounds like an icky word, but the way to really connect with them on a different level emotionally is to let them know how you can impact their life, how these photos can impact their life today, not in 10 years from now, not in 20 years from now. So that's something to ponder and think about of just a starting point of how you can figure out what problem you solve um, and how you can meet their needs. And the other thing that marketing is, is marketing is what, what you do to get your message and promise to customers and shows what value you have to offer, whereas branding defines your business and is how you keep your promise made through delivery to customers. So the reason I'm mentioning branding in here is because we're going to talk about branding today as well. There's something really um, important about business, and that is branding, because everything you do should be based on your brand, and we can't do marketing without branding. Um, and lastly, to know is that marketing takes time. It's not a, you know, I put out a Facebook post or an Instagram post, and suddenly my inbox is filled with inquiries of clients who want to book me. Marketing takes a lot of effort, and it uh, is a long game. So it can be quite frustrating at times. Sometimes you might get lucky and actually have that happen where you put one quick promotion out there and you get a lot of uh, people interested and in inquiring. But most of the time, that's not the case. So that's why it's really important you keep up with consistency and don't give up on it. Don't throw it in the towel um, just because something didn't work. And instead, what you'll be doing is looking at the efforts you've made, which ones are working for you, asking your clients or your inquiries questions like, where did you find me when they call and inquire about a session or they um, book with you or when they send you an email? One of the best things you can do is ask them how they found you, because that's letting you know if your marketing efforts are working or not. OK, so moving on, the ultimate goal with marketing like I said, it takes a lot of time, but the ultimate goal, once you get to a certain point, is that you get to a place where all of your clients are coming from repeat customers that come to you year after year, or at least every other year, and referrals. So those people who have been with you are referring their friends, their colleagues, their family members, et cetera. And at that point, your marketing becomes easy. But in order to get to that point, it does take a lot of work. So hang in there, like I said, and yeah, keep working at it. And at some point it will get this way. Pre-COVID, this is how mine was. Um, I was pretty much booked out usually five to six months in advance at all times. Um, Post-COVID, I had to start a lot of my marketing endeavors again. And I don't do, I'll talk about this a little later again, but I don't do a lot of marketing on online. Most of my marketing is done offline. So um but it required me to reach out to a lot of my, my previous clients, let them know, hey, I'm back um, doing business, everything's good, I'm allowed to photograph again, et cetera, as well as trying to bring in some new clients and nurturing my old clients and asking them to refer me to their friends so I could get my business back moving once we were able to work again. So there's some core components of marketing. <clears throat> and I'm just going to go over them quickly here. So brand positioning or branding is that you establish a unique and memorable brand. Again, I'll go deeper into branding in just a few minutes. Um, messaging is crafting a compelling and consistent, uh, consistent messages. Products and services is what you need to define and understand what you are offering. Again, without knowing what your brand is and your foundation and how it is you want to impact people and what you want to show them, et cetera. It's really hard to um, figure out exactly what services you want to offer, what session links, what types of sessions or genres, as well as, um, you know, are you offering albums or storybooks or are you doing digitals or what, are, what is it exactly that you're going to offer? Um, all of this leads back to branding. Same thing with messaging. You can't create messaging without having an understanding of your brand and your foundation. And target audience. 
identifying and analyzing your ideal customers. A lot of times when you take a marketing course or learn about marketing, one of the first things they have you do is identify and analyze your ideal clients or customers, the people you want to work with. Um, I have a different way of teaching marketing and branding in particular, in that I think it's important for you to identify who you are and again, what impact you're having, what impact your photos are having. And from there, you can start to decide the type of people you want to work with based on who is going to be drawn to what it is you have to offer. So like I said, typically they teach, hey, let's set out you know, this target market of, oh, people that shop at this store and this store and this store, and they have this job and they drive this type of car and they're this age and they have this job. And then from there you build your brand to fit what, the, what you think those people will want. And I find that a really difficult feat to hold on to and be consistent with because it doesn't feel like you. So instead, I highly suggest figuring out what your brand is first, who you are, what it is you want to do, why you want to do it, why people should care, what impact you're having, et cetera. And then from there, you can figure out, okay, who's my target audience and who's going to be drawn to this? Because it might surprise you and be different than who you originally thought. Um, and then from there is the channels. So choosing the right platforms uh, that you're going to use to reach your audience. So marketing helps you do quite a few things, a lot of things, but I summed it up here into these three, and that is to create brand awareness, that's the main one, and to ge generate leads and bookings, and then to establish and maintain client relationships. And here it is, this is where we're going into branding, and I talked to you uh, momentarily about that process of them getting to know that you exist, to like you, and then to trust you. So that's the process that people need to, this journey that people need to go on in order to book with you. And then not only to book with you, but to come back to you and then to refer their friends to you. So to me, this process of knowing all starts with branding. And we use branding because it acts like a compass for a, what direction we want to take our business, our photography, um, what types of people we want to work work with, and it acts as a filter for decision making. So as creative people, we get distracted really easily um, by all the different things, right? We might see something on Instagram or see a new product and we're like, yes, I want that, or I need to try that, or I need to recreate that, or you, whatever it is. And if you don't have a solid brand foundation, it's really easy to get distracted and start trying 90 different things and never completing anything. Whereas if you have a brand set up and you figured it all out, you can use it as a filter to say, oh, I really like that. That's really interesting to me. But does it go along with my brand and my foundation and who I am? And if it doesn't, then you can say, oh, it's a pretty thing. It's a nice thing. It's an inspiring thing, but I don't need to do it, right? In addition to this, branding, most importantly, helps us to create messaging. We need messaging for everything, our websites, our um, marketing campaigns, um, pretty much everything and anything that we do in business, we need messaging for, even how we set up our pricing. We need the messaging to be the, the correct way so that we can articulate the value of what we provide. Um, with your messaging, this is something that takes a ton of time to boil down and figure out, um, but it is doable and it's just a process. And one of the bi biggest processes or points of it is making a choice. And that's really hard sometimes to say, okay, this is it. This is what I'm doing. Um, also, it's important to remember that making a choice doesn't mean that you're stuck with that forever. It does mean that you're making a choice, you're going with that, and you're making sure it feels right. And then if you need to, you can tweak it along the way um, to make it feel better at some point. <clears throat> and then again, with your messaging, um, in addition to that, that's where you start creating things like your elevator pitch, right? So when someone in person asks you, oh, what do you do? You can give them a synopsis of what you do without feeling like you're tripping up on your words, right? It doesn't have to be memorized. It doesn't have to be a script. But if you have these few bullet points that you know you want to hit, I do this for these types of people because of this, because it impacts their life in this way, that's your messaging, right? 
And then from there, branding is also uh, needs to be well-defined, simple to understand, relevant, and consistent. The biggest thing is consistency. I mean, all of it's big, but one of the biggest things is consistency. Um, we trust more based on how consistent some something is or someone is, right? So how someone shows up, whether that be fr in friendships or, you know, a business, it's really important to offer that consistency, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, that way people can learn to trust you, right? I like to use the analogy of too much plastic surgery. If a brand is changing constantly, changing their wording, changing their messaging, changing their look, changing their values, et cetera, it's like someone that keeps going back to plastic surgery. So a little bit of nipping and tucking, a little Botox here or there, a little filler, whatever you need to do might be great. But sometimes you go a little too far and you start looking like a cat. And in that case, people aren't gonna trust you because they don't know what you truly look like. The other biggest thing with branding to know is it's not just about logos and colors and fonts and those pretty things. Those are the fun things. And um, it does have a bit to do with that. But most importantly, it has to do with your mission, purpose, and vision, as well as your values, your brand promises, the experience that you give your clients, or even people, if they don't become your clients, how they um experience you when they call, when they inquire, et cetera, is going to have a lasting impression in their mind. So um, that's a big part of branding as well as a differentiation. Um, how are you different than other photographers out there? How are you different than um, other people out there? You know, this is a character background of you. It's your story. And that's part of how you create your brand, especially in the documentary family photography world. Um, it's really important to allow yourself to be truly who you are because we're asking people to let us into their homes, to show us their vulnerable side and invite us into their lives. And we need to be able to do that the same um, in the same way, um, not necessarily us, you know, giving ourselves a bath in front of them or something like that, like <laughs> they might be doing, but um, in other ways of figuring out exactly what has brought you to this point. And again, why you've decided this is what you want your, or how you want your photos to impact people. Um, then we talked about identity, which is those things like logos, colors, fonts, et cetera. In addition to the, the visuals of it, there's also your verbal identity. And that goes into your tone, um, you know, how you write as well as talk about your business. Um, you know, are you witty? Are you more poetic, et cetera? You, they can go a ton of different ways. And then in addition to that, there's interaction and communication. So um, how you communicate with clients, is it, are you doing everything via pale, uh, post, snail mail? Um, are you doing it via text message? Are you doing it through telephone? Are you doing it through social media? Is it a full on, full touch um, point, process with all of your clients and experience that they're getting, as well as um, where you're showing up and where they can interact with you. So before I move on to the next little part, just wanted to ask, does anyone have questions about this branding stuff? You can unmute yourself. I had to catch my breath. Okay. I'm going to look at questions. Oh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, and I don't know if this will be covered like further down the line, but with the the prevalence now of um, like AI generated content, not talking images, so, you know, necessarily, but copy, yeah. um, how, and I don't know if I'm just looking for permission, you know, I come from a journalism background, so that's mm -hmm. like a huge no-no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, yeah. we write all different stuff. Um, how how okay is it? Would you say to to utilize that in your branding, in your in your website copy, in your social media posts? I mean, obviously, personalizing it, and and I know a lot of the the engines, Grammarly, OpenAI, um, you can kind of set a tone that you're going for. Yeah. Um, do you think that we'll see that more and more? Do you think that is is going to become more of the norm? Um, um, I I personally do, and I'll tell you, I'm not 100% against it. 
Okay. I'm not actually, I'm not against it at all. And here's why. Even I consider myself to be a writer. Before I was a photographer, I was a writer. Um, I started actually photographing because I couldn't, I, like I wanted to document my time of moving to Germany. I've been here 13 years. That's beside the point. I thought it was going to be short term. Um, and then what happened was when my son was born, um, I was started keeping a journal for him. And um, at the time, obviously, I didn't know. Now we know my, my son um, is on the autism spectrum. And there was something about me not being able to put him into words. And that drove me crazy because I could put everything into words. And I realized how close I was. When you're so close to something, sometimes it's really hard to describe. And that's when I turned to photography because I was like, I need to see him in this other way. I need to, I need to really see him and know him because I felt like I can put him into words. And sometimes that's how it is with our business. We're so close to it and we know what we want to say. We know the feeling we're trying to give, but we just can't find the damn word. And so there's, there. I mean, we have thesauruses out there, right? <laughs> like there's things like that, that you can utilize. Um, Word Hippo is one of my favorite online th thesauruses uh, ever because it just sends you down like this rabbit hole of different words you can use. It's really a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful resource. But in addition to that, I've even had points in my copy where I'm like, this is what I want to say. How can I say it. And you can obviously hire a copywriter. That would be the best way to do it because, you know, you're getting this interaction, this back and forth. You can really get to the meat and potatoes of it. And, um, you know, they, they can do it, do it for you. You can also try and work on it forever yourself. But there do, does come a point you need to have some kind of basis there. So when it comes to finding your mission, purpose, vision, for example, you can't put it into AI and just hope it spits it out at you. That takes like in the in no more effing around the year long mentoring class um, that I teach with Jenna, the mission, purpose and vision is takes months. I mean, it's a lesson that I present because there's so much that goes into it. There's a lot of introspective work. It's a lot about looking at your story and your history and your this, that, the other, and figuring out the things that are aligning with you and how you've gotten to where you are and how you've evolved and how that mission, purpose, and vision might evolve over time as well. And it's not an easy process and it's definitely not something that you could, uh, it is, here, let me take that back. You could definitely use AI and say, spit me out a mission, purpose, and vision, but it's not going to be you, it's not going to be unique, and it's not going to um, uh, feel right, I guess is the way to put it. However, if you do have an overall feeling of what you're trying to go for, and you know what you're trying to say, and you have like these words you've pulled, pulled together and all of these other things, and you can use AI to decipher, <laughs> what that is, like translate that for you, I say go for it. Maybe that makes me a bad person, <laughs> but I'm all about the tools. I mean, AI is a scary, scary beast, if we're honest, but at the same time, um, one of my students from, M from No More Effing Around from this past year, 2023, posted in the group, like, documentary family photography AI. I'll try and show the picture at the end of this. I'll see if I, and it was the creepiest thing I've ever seen, um, the photo it spit out. But when it comes to writing and prompts and things, I think it can also help you to launch yourself further, right? You don't necessarily need to copy and paste what it says, but sometimes it can be like, yes, that is how I'm trying to say it. And now I can add these things in, right? I don't think it should be a direct copy and paste. Does that answer your question? I'm always really long-winded when answering no. questions. <laughs> the same way. That's perfect. Okay. Maybe. Sure. Okay. Anybody else? I, I did have a quick question, um, and it kind of bounces off of what I think Melissa was kind of going at in, at the idea of using AI as something that may could end up making you feel inauthentic to your audience. Yeah. Um, you were talking about that visual and verbal identity and different types of communication. And as you were talking, I was realizing that um, I do not prefer to text people. I would prefer to have a conversation in person or um, 
talk on the phone or do a video chat, right? I, I don't I don't like texting. Um, and I realized that that is probably a stumbling block. Um, like my style of communication, I want it to be more authentic. Yeah. But I also recognize that I'm in a world that has very much embraced um, very quick communication that went something super fast. And even though that's not me, I feel like um, I may be shutting myself out to potential clients because I'm not communicating in the way that they would prefer. Yeah. So I guess I just want to know, like, should we navigate towards using a different type of um, identity, if you will, or a different type of communication style, even if it isn't authentically us? Like, is that, yeah. does that make sense? So, yeah, this, this falls more under um, like your area of innovation. Um, uh, you're looking at this idea of convenience through talking through text and, and it's convenient for them, right? Not necessarily convenient for you. Cause I'm the same way. I'm like, it feels so much easier to me to talk than to write up a text. Um, especially cause I have to write the text in German. And then I have to think about if my grammar is correct and blah, blah, blah. Whereas if I can just talk, my German comes out easier. So, um, the, to answer your question though, my, opinion on this is it's going to depend on a few things. Number one is your market. Are you in a fast paced market like New York, New York City, right? Where people are like, you know, going through or are you in somewhere that they're okay with that first communication, they email you or send you a text and you say, hey, can we get on a phone call? That is how I do it. Um, I, I give them some brief information over email if they've contacted me that way. And then I say, I'd love to get on a phone call and chat with you. Um, does this date and time work or what time works best for you? Um, and then I tell them the reason why I want to do that. Um, the reason I want to do that is I want to make sure we're a great fit for each other. Um, documentary fa family photography is very personal and I want to make sure, you know, it, it is, it's a personal interaction, the type of photography we do. It's not like they're just showing up to our studio and we never get to see this other side of them. We're going into their homes uh, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times. Or in my case, I'm going to their birth, you know, and where they're giving birth. This is a really intimate setting. And so for me, I still utilize the telephone a lot. Um, I also meet with my clients in person before I actually do their session. Um, that's just how I do it, but there's no right or wrong way. So if for some people they feel more comfortable with text and writing, they can do that, but you still need to find a way to make that a quality service and to um, communicate that the reason you are texting and writing email, et cetera, is to provide convenience for them and et cetera, right? To provide value. Whereas for me, I can communicate to them, oh, I like to talk to you verbally because of these reasons. This is why it's valuable to you that I'm picking up the phone, contacting you verbally, and we're having a conversation. Uh, first of all, it's so you don't see my terrible grammar when I write German. Um, and second of all, it's so that we have a connection. And people understand that. So even if they're like, oh, no, I really prefer text. I mean, if they really prefer, prefer text, you have two options or email, right? So written, written communication. You have two options. One is you can say, OK, and move it to that written communication. Or you can say, no, this is how I run my business. Obviously, you're not going to say, no, this is how I run my business to them. But you can say, I'm sorry, you know, for me, it's really important to make that verbal connection with my clients. And you make the rules, right? That's your business, your choice. So you get to choose how flexible you'll be with it. Um, if you make exceptions for people, or if you say, no, you know what, this is this is how I want to run my business. And this is how I'm going to do it. And these are the types of people I connect with. Good. Anybody else? Okay. So moving on. So the next one here, oh, and I slipped water really quick. Excuse me. Okay, so the next one here is getting them to like you. And we're doing this to generate leads and bookings, right? So we started with them getting to know you. In order for them to know you, you have to have, I'm going to go back for a second. You have to have your brand set up. Um, and you want people to know you exist. Sorry, that's one of the big things I meant to say here. Um, you people, If people don't know you exist, they can't buy your services or book you to do anything. 
So you need to let them know you exist and what you're all about. And we do that through branding and how we're showing up, the interactions we're having, as well as the communication. Um, yeah, so we need to let them know we exist. And then we move on to this next phase, which is um, getting them to like you. And this is going to generate leads and hopefully bookings. Again, the idea behind this is that consistency is key. So not only is your branding consistent, but what you're putting out there is consist consistent. I'll uh, go further on this in a minute. And again, it only works well if you have rooted out your brand, meaning if you want to be able to generate leads and bookings, you need to have done that first step of figuring out what your brand foundation is <clears throat> and being able to put that into motion, basically. Because once you do that, you can start creating uh, the things you need to, such as content for digital marketing, et cetera, for your website copy, um, figuring out who your target audience is, et cetera, et cetera. From there, um, also you have your ele elevator pitch or brand messaging, which we talked about previously. Your elevator pitch is just that quick and easy um, way of when someone says, oh, what do you do for a living? And you get to tell them, I'm a photographer, I'm this type of photographer for this type of people because of this reason and this is how it's good for them, right? And then the other thing we have here is considering ways to create authority. I added this last point in because I do, I previously I went back and forth a lot on how I felt about things like competitions um, or, you know, things along those lines. And I realized that uh, looking at it, it does create an authority. So it's a way to make yourself stand out and have an authority in your market. If you enter a competition and you win, um, or even get an honorable mention, or let's say you exhibit somewhere, or you end up in a in a magazine, or if you're on a directory listing or part of an association, any of those things create authority in who you are in, in your business. And so people look at you then as um, the expert. So generating leads and bookings, uh, it starts out with doing that target market um, research and research. So figuring out who your target market is, as well as <clears throat> where you're at in the market, what other photographers in your area are doing, um, and how you're different than they are. Um, researching the type of clients you want and where they ha hang out and showing up in those places. Portfolio building. So um, doing enough portfolio builds for two reasons. One, that you have enough content for your website or actually multiple reasons. I mean, there's like 90 reasons to portfolio builds, but um, having content for your website as well as marketing material and your Instagram and anywhere else you're showing up. And then in addition to that, um, being able to, to shoot in a variety of situations and create consistency in your work um, as well as in your workflow. So um, how you are dealing with clients, portfolio building is a great time to practice that and figure out exactly how you want your workflow to be. Um, we have partnerships, networking, and collaborations. That is a variety of things. So partnering with other businesses or brands in your community, as well as showing up at networking events or even um, festivals or, um, God, why I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the name, um, you know, like little markets that you can have a booth at. Um, or collaborating with other photographers or creatives in your city or your town um, or anywhere, really. So those are all really important and create uh, likability in you, as well as creating content and digital marketing means to things like blog posts, um, newsletters, um, social media, et cetera, all that good stuff. Your website and SEO is going to become really important. Um, as well as any special promotions you put out there. So the whole idea behind this is that once you get people going onto your website and seeing, you know, they figured out you exist, you give them your business card or, you know, they find your Instagram, like whatever happens, they go to your website, they find you via Google. However it happens, you want to build up um, enough interest that they're like, okay, let me find out more about this person, what they're about. And that's where we're telling them, oh, this is what I do for you. This is why you should care. This is how it impacts you. Um, and from there, you can nurture that relationship and build trust. So we want 
to get them from like, and then I have trust smaller here because we're starting to get their trust, right? Enough trust that they're like, okay, I'm interested in this person and it's not gonna be a complete waste of my time. Then it's a matter of keeping their trust, right? In addition to that, it's, you know, the first time they're booking, that's great, but we want them to like us enough and trust us enough to book again and again. And like I said before, to recommend us to all of their friends, colleagues, et cetera. Um, okay, when it comes to guidance on SEO, that's I'm not necessarily the best person with that. I'll tell you why. Because SEO, I was just reading from the chat here. Um, SEO is something I tried to um, tackle. That's the word I'll use. And I got frustrated with it because it changes all the time. Like what, like things that they want from you versus things they don't. What, on a very basic level, I am okay with SEO. But when it comes to all like the tiny ins and outs, so like little tips I can give you would be uh, making sure the metadata on your photos as well as on the back end of your website and keywords and all that are in place for your work. Um, making sure your location is on and making sure you actually have information on your homepage. Even though it looks really pretty to just have a, um, um, you know, a header image and saying like, click here to enter, that's not doing much for your SEO. You want to have actual wording on your homepage and ideally on every page on your website. Um, things like, Having um, your site linked from other sites is also really good, whether that be you having a blog post or you, you know, having an award in that that uh, competition website is linking back to you or you having a listing on a directory and that linking back to you. Those things all help. Um, having a Google listing helps all of that good stuff. But when it comes to like the super ins and outs of it, I stopped following it, following it because it drove me bananas. And now I just hire someone to do it. Um, there's my honesty for you. <laughs> okay. So, and then we go into that next phase, which is um, establish and maintain relationships and trust. Again, consistency is key. Oops, I forgot to update this. I just saw this now. It only works as well as if you have uh, your brand rooted. It's the same thing. So, um, what I feel develops the most trust besides nurturing the relationship before they've booked you. So we've gotten, we're talking like after they've booked you one time, how to get them to come back and refer you some more is um, backend marketing and workflow. So what this looks like is that um, you have created a, entire an entire experience for them that they know they can rely on every single time they come to you and in addition to that when they tell their friends about it that they can um, know that you're going to give that same experience to their friends now this doesn't have to be some huge workflow that's you know pages and pages long. It can be as simple as you want, but the key here is consistency and making them feel very valuable and that what they're receiving is valuable, right? Um, what we have to remember about branding is at the end of the day with our brand, it's really what people are saying about us. So we can try and influence what they're saying about us by putting out pretty graphics, pretty pictures, putting out nice messaging, but the experience they have with us and the feeling they get with us is truly what makes our brand because it's what they feel about us and how they talk about us when we're not around. So um, establishing and maintaining a relationships is going to be really important in order to get to that point of, okay, I don't have to work so hard on my marketing, right? I don't have to like constantly be stressing about this because you get to this point where you're just nurturing relationships from your previous clients who then are coming back to you over and over and referring you to their friends and colleagues and family. Um, that's why I suggest creating a referral or loyalty program. And that can look really simple. Uh, as simple as a refer your friend and get, you know, $50 off your next session or get a free print or whatever. And they, your friend also gets $50 off. Like it can be anything you want. 
a referral program. Uh, you'll want to create a way to keep track of it, of who referred who, and you want to make sure you're always asking, um, like I said in the very beginning, how did you find me? That way you know if Janet referred Susan, you can thank Janet and let them know, hey, Susan came to me, just so you know, you get 50 bucks off your next session. And then you can uh, start deciding on rules. Like, is Janet allowed to, if she refers 10 people, does she get 50, $50 off of 10 sessions or, or, or is it $50 off or $50 off times 10? So 500 bucks off. I'd be like, I don't care. She sent me 10 people off photograph Janet for free. Janet's amazing. Right. So you get to decide what that looks like and what the rules are there. Again, uh, creating that content and digital marketing. I'm here's the truth. I'm not huge on digital marketing myself. 99.8% of my marketing is done offline. I use my website, of course. Um, and I do have a newsletter that I send out here and there. But the majority of my con of, of my marketing is done offline. So creating relationships, connecting with people that way, as well as, um, you know, sending birthday cards or Christmas gifts or whatever it is that I need to stay on top of mind for them. And, but it does help when you're establishing and maintaining those relationships to give people updates about you and to um, let them know what is going on with, you know, what you're offering at that time. So when it comes to special promotions, for example, you might have for your um, people who have been with you a really long time, every Christmas um, you offer like um, an option for them to buy more prints or more um, albums at a discounted rate, right? So they're getting special offers. You're nurturing that relationship. But in addition to that, it's not just giving offers all the time of something for them to buy from you. It's also just letting them know you're thinking about them. So like in my case, I, <clears throat> excuse me, am friends with quite a few, actually all of my clients pretty much end up being my friends, um, which clearly I have an issue with boundaries, but um, <laughs> they do, they end up being my friends because I'm working with the type of people I like. And because of that, it's really easy for me to reach out to them and be like, hey, I was just thinking about you, right? And, oh my gosh, I can't believe, you know, I saw the picture of so, you know, little Johnny or whatever, right? It could be any of those things. And it's just making a connection and creating a relationship um, or maintaining that relationship. When it comes to backend marketing, oh God, I'm trying to think if I, if there's an easy way for you, for me to show you, I'll do it at the end. Okay. Um, I can show you my, what my workflow looks like very briefly. It's going to be a quick scroll through because it, a lot of it is like content from the year long mentoring. Um, but just like as a, an idea of what I do for each of my clients, I have this entire process. And again, keep in mind, I'm hot mess express, but organized chaos. So I've made this work in a way that is functional for me. But that is that every client that comes into contact with me is having that same experience. Um, and so they know what to expect. And not only that, but it's helping to maintain our relationship because it requires me to keep in touch with them in some way. And when you keep in touch, you're at the front of their mind, right? So all of this is part of marketing. It's just the long game. And it's to get you to that point of referrals and loyalty. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up this little part here, it's these three phases of marketing and depending on what phase you are in or working on will dictate what kind of tactics you use, where you show up and even possibly the way you have your system set up for that phase. So what I mean for, by this is, you know, you might be out of this phase of people needing to know you exist, right? You Let's say that you've gone out there and people know you exist. And so now what you need to do is get people to like you, right? And so you're into this area and what do you need to think about? What system do you need to set up to capture leads um, and then to nurture re leads? So this could be getting an email list set up. It could even be just making sure you collect people's information, excuse me, to, um, to be able to send them snail mail, right? show up in their mailbox. It could be a number of things, but you come up with a system for capturing leads or people who 
have become interested in getting to getting to know you more. Um, and then what your sales conversion strategy is. So at what point in time do you say, hey, do you want to book a session with me? So these th three things need to happen. You capture the lead. Um, so let's say someone signs up on your mailing list. From there, you have a welcome series that goes out and it's educational for them. It's letting them know the best ways to take photos of their family, uh, the best ways to enjoy the photographs of their family, as well as a little bit about what's going on in your town that summer and where they might be able to see you at some local markets, right? And then from there, the next email goes out and it's them having an offer. Hey, here's my introductory rate for you. It's I'm so happy to have you a part of my um, network. Please let me know if you'd like to book a session now before um, the end of February for the year 2024, um, and you'll get this as a promotion, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Did that make sense? Sorry, I blacked out for a minute. Um, <laughs> okay, moving on from there. Actually, I'll go to the before phase. This is people getting to know you. We already talked about this, is making sure you have your target market, your message to your target market, and the media you use for reaching your target market. So when you're putting out marketing, however that may be, whether it be in person or online or any other way, you need to figure out who it is you're talking to. Again, this is after you've established your brand. So who it is you're talking to. Um, there's different segments of your target market, especially if you're offering different types of photography. So for me, I'm offering birth as well as family. And so I might be targeting the birth mom, uh, birthing community. And in that case, my target market is going to be different than just trying to shoot a family session, right? And so when I'm thinking about my marketing that I'm putting out there, I'm thinking, okay, how am I appealing to these people? Where are they at? Um, where, where are they looking at? Are they looking on Pinterest because they're deciding how to decorate baby's room? Um, those kinds of things. And then the messaging I want for that target market as well as how I'm going to uh, reach them. Then we have that dur a during phase, which is getting them to like you, where you capture the lead, you nurture it, and you convert them to um, a booking client. And then the after phase, which is where they trust you and buy from you regularly and refer you, which is how you deliver the world-class experience, how you increase customer lifetime value, and how you orchestrate and stimulate referrals. Um, increasing the customer lifetime value, again, has to do with um, is there a perk for them being loyal, like having a loyalty program? If you have a loyalty program that they, you know, if they book with you again and again, do they get something in return for that? Um, in addition, is there ways that you can push that even further? Like um, clients who I photograph more than twice can sign up for my um, quarterly photo session package. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up right now. But as an example, maybe you're only offering that to people who have worked with you before, because if you're spending that much time with someone, you want to make sure you like them. Um, so just some thoughts on that. Okay, let's see. Let me, I just wanted to look in. Is there any questions before I go on from there? Okay. I'm talking a lot, so I have to drink a lot of water. Otherwise, oh, hi, Melissa, go ahead. Oh, no, it's Melanie. It's Melanie. Sorry. Um, call me Melissa all the time for some reason. Um, Her name uh, is right oh. above your head. And so when, and you're, the oh, one, you're on the bottom. So then, yeah, anyways, yes. Then once you yeah. unmuted it, showed your, your name. That was weird. Um, I would love your thoughts on how to cap how to capture leads. Like, if you have something on your website that draws people in, or if you have any ideas around that, because I that's yeah, I'm sort absolutely. of lost. So I would suggest. Um, do you want? Let me ask you this really quick, Melanie. Do you want the actual system I'm using to capture the leads, or like both? like what I'm using to get people as leads? Um, the ideas, do you mean? Yeah, like, yeah. okay. Yeah, so do you mean so, like system software or do yeah, you Yeah, because I have, but like, it, you know, it's like this process you put into place. So there's a few ways I'm capturing leads. 
Um, the first is on my website having a newsletter sign up. And ideally, and for a very long time, I did have this, but I need to update it. Um, I had a newsletter opt-in for them to get, you know, 10 free tips on using their cell phone to photograph kids, as an example. Um, it could also have nothing to do with photography. It could be like uh, the 10 best places to visit in such and such town. You know, it's it's really up to you. But the idea is to create some kind of lead magnet magnet that's interesting. Um, I'll give you an example of DFP's lead lead man, blah 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 lead magnet. That's what that opt-in is called. Um, ours was or has been for a really long time to get the break-even analysis spreadsheet from my pricing course. So that was our lead magnet, how we built our leads. <clears throat> and then offline, when it comes to offline, there's a few different ways I'm collecting leads. One is um, I'm constantly talking to people, giving them my business card and directing them to my website. So then they're seeing that lead magnet. So that's one way. <clears throat> Another way is that when if I'm showing up at a market somewhere or an exposition or whatever, I might be doing um, market research. But I think that's a great opportunity. I'm not always expecting when I'm if I have a table at a market or if I'm showing up to an event or something that I'm going to book people there. Right. So I set a goal in my mind. What's my goal for going to this event? What do I hope to get out of it? A lot of times it's just to get new leads or to do market research. I'm not expecting necessarily to book someone. And if I do, it's like a great bonus. So usually I use it as an opportunity to do market research. And what I'm doing is I have a questionnaire of like 10 questions that I want people to answer for me. And if they answer, they can get entered into a drawing for a free session, for a free two hour session, right? And in order for that to happen, I need them to give me their name and email address as well as consent to them allowing me to add them to my email list. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? Yeah, they have to consent to that I can add them to my list. Um, so I'm getting two things out of that. One is I'm getting market research done. I'm able to ask questions, find out where my people are hanging out, what they're interested in right now. Um, a good question might be the one like for market research, do you prefer communicating via telephone, via text or via email? Like that's a market research question, right? <clears throat> what social media networking sites are you hanging out at? What does a typical Saturday look like? Have you heard of documentary photography before? When you hear of that, what do you think of? What do you think is a reasonable price? Usually pricing questions are crap because they don't know, but it's still interesting to see what people say. What's a reasonable price for an album? You know, those are the types of mar market research I'm doing when I'm at an event like that. Um, and then in return, I'm saying, hey, for your your answers, I'll give you the chance to win the session. And for the people that don't win, guess what? You still get 50 bucks off of a session with me or whatever, some kind of introductory rate. So they can try it and see if they like it. Um, as far as like a system, the the um Got the email opt-in I use on my website, I just have it linked to my uh, MailChimp is the email newsletter thing I use. And so that's linked there. But I also have it linked to a spreadsheet, like a Google Docs spreadsheet, um, that then I can import that into my CRM software, which holds all, all of my leads. So anyone that contacts me via email, whether they book or don't book, anybody who you know, I end up getting their contact information from that seemed kind of interested in a session. It'll go into my leads there and um, that kind of thing. Did that answer your question? Again, really long-winded. I apologize, everyone. Uh, thank you. So helpful. Thanks. Good. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? All right. So moving on. <clears throat> I'm just going to briefly talk about marketing mix. <clears throat> Excuse me. Marketing mix is, you may have heard of this before. There's the P's of marketing. Um, some say there's five P's, some say there's seven P's, some say there's eight. Um, but the main four are these here. And these are the things you need in order to start marketing in the first place, right? Um, and to start making your marketing happen, basically. So you need to have, um, again, branding to start out with, but beside the point, um, a product and service. So um, 
figuring out exactly what it, what you're offering, um, the types of sessions you're offering, the genres, um, the products you might want to offer with that, the features, the value it brings, um, the impact it has on people, as well as the quality of service or products that you're offering. So um, being able to market with that is really great. You need to have a pricing strategy in place. Um, you can, the pricing strategy is going to look different for every market. A lot of people ask me, what, how do I price my, my sessions? I'll tell you how I price my sessions, but I will also say that what works for me doesn't work for everybody. Um, my sessions start at 250 euro per hour. Um, and I charge an hourly rate and then, um, people buy products afterwards. My birth photography is priced different. It's more of an all-inclusive rate, and that starts at 2700 And then from there, I also do like small elopements and stuff like that. But um, yeah, anyways, uh, moving on. <laughs> um, place. Uh, place is how you're showing up, where you're showing up. Again, what distribution channels you're using. Are you using social media? Are you using uh, your mailing list? Are you guest blogging? Are you showing up, showing up on podcasts? Do you have a YouTube channel? Are you um, accessible in all places? Do you have partnerships that you're advertising with? Like, how is that working for you? Um, and then the same thing with promotion is using advertisement, public relations, communication strategies, et cetera. Et cetera. Talking about public relations, um, Another thing I wanted to mention, anytime you have a competition or an award that you've won, or let's say you were chosen for an exhibit, that's the perfect time to set out a press release um, and letting people know like, hey, photographer in our town won this award. We have some really great examples of uh, press releases that we've helped people send out who have exhibited with us. You can find it on the DFP exhibit website. Um, Again, I might be able to, yeah, I'll, I'm scared to close out of this because I'm scared I won't be able to find my way back. So I'll show it in a minute. But if you want to look at it now, it's, um, I'll put it in the chat. It's dfp-gallery.com. And um, there's an area there. I'm trying to remember what page it's on, but it has people who have gotten uh, press releases out. The other thing is, is um, we've had a lot of people do like radio in interviews, um, a students of mine who have gotten on radio or local news to talk about the work that they're doing, which I think is incredibly cool. Um, yeah. So again, marketing mix, products and service, place, uh, price, place, and promotion, right? So you need these things to happen in order to start bringing people in. This is what you need to do in order to even start your marketing. You need to know these things, where you're going to be showing up, how are you going to be putting yourself out there, what product and service you're offering, as well as at what price point. Um, you want to have all this set up. Um, Roxanne asks, do you require product purchase with you? I personally do not, and I'll tell you why. Um, I am really confident that people are going to buy products regardless. And so for me, it's one of my selling points of how I have my pricing set up. I um, feel really strongly that I don't want people to have to buy anything that they don't want. Um, and so I'm able to tell them, hey, you're paying a session fee. My session fee is 250 euro an hour. But if you don't like it, if you don't like the photographs, no pressure, you don't have to buy any. You've paid for my time already and that's covered, but no pressure, you don't have to buy anything. I know you're going to because I know you will love them, right? Like, of course, I'm telling, I'm, I'm confirming with them, reaffirming with them that they're making the right choice by booking me, but I'm also giving them a bit of control by saying, but you don't have to buy any of the pictures, right? There's no commitment there. I do know some people do the required product purchase. I think it's absolutely fine to do. There is no right or wrong way of pricing as long as it's working for you and your market and that you're profitable. And I think that's a really major thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, Andy asks, do you deliver those clients a low res watermark gallery? Are those photos adjusted? 
Um, by adjusted, do you mean toned or edited or um, what my clients get for booking the session with me? Okay, yeah, they're toned. So anything I'm showing my clients is always going to be toned. I don't do like um, a um, gallery of them just seeing unedited and then they choose which photos they want. I want my clients to trust me enough to know what photos um, are going to be best for them. So we have that whole conversation. There's a lot of education happening. Um, again, that could be like a whole, whole nother class. But um, basically when I'm meeting with my clients, the, what they're getting for that 250 an hour, they do get a slideshow included. And then any uh, photo that they purchase as a physical print, they're getting the social media size File. I don't use the word low res because it sounds negative. So they get the social media size file, which they can share on social media or send to grandma and grandpa via email, et cetera. Um, and so that includes with the album. If they have an album with 50 images, they will get the social media size uh, 50 images that were included in that, that, um, that album. So let's see, um, do I watermark? the gallery. So typically I'm not sending a gallery necessarily. I do mostly in person um, or over Zoom ordering appointments. If I need to the do it via a gallery for some reason, I will and it will be watermarked. After they've purchased the photos or whatever, I'm not necessarily watermarking them because um, I really, yeah, I just don't really mind. I guess technically I could, it would be another way of marketing for me, right? If I had a little watermark in the corner, but I also have a feeling or I have seen, not a feeling, I have seen myself when um, clients have posted the work, they will say that this, you know, this photographer did these photos or if their friends ask, they're like, oh my God, I love the photos. Who did those? They're going to say, they're not like hiding it. Um Let's see, I'm just gonna scroll up really quick. Um, how do I show them to my clients? So um, again, I show them mostly in person. What I'm usually doing is showing a slideshow that I've created in Smart Slides. Um, I can, when I send out the recording for this, I don't know if you all have Smart Slides and Smart Albums, I can include a link to it as well as I think I have a discount code. So I'll include it in the email, I think. Don't take my word on it. I'm just pretty sure, like 90%. Um, and then, yeah, I'm showing them a mock-up of an album that I've already created, and they have the choice to switch out images or add some in if they'd like to. Okay, Melissa asked, in your opinion, what are the top three digital social media platforms for marketing? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I told you I'm not... I'm not a lover of um, social media marketing stuff necessarily. It be here's my feeling on it. I think it's a necessary. It is necessary, not unnecessary. It is necessary. Um, if anything, I don't think you're necessarily going to find clients there, depending on where your market is. So certain markets you definitely will, um, but in a lot of markets, like my market in particular, you're not going to. And so, um, for me. I don't spend a lot of time there. I do have stuff on my social media because I want clients to, once they do go to my website or start researching me, to be able to see I do have a social media presence. But they're not necessarily finding me that way, right? They're just using that to confirm my existence. Um, but if I had to choose, obviously for digital platforms, like the digital marketing ways would be obviously website, newsletter, those are like the two main things that I would utilize. And then social media, I would definitely say um, Instagram. <sighs> Facebook is hit and miss. It's just really going to depend on your market. Um, and I can see how Pinterest could work. Depending. I mean, with like the wedding industry, it works really well. With fam family photography industry, it could work well if you use the correct captions or words or whatever under your pins. Um, 
but not everyone's like mostly people go on there to look for ideas about a family photographer and they're not necessarily searching like New York City family photographer. So to me, I'm like, I'd rather invest my time in something like SEO on my website than invest all my time in creating pins for Pinterest. Um, I know I feel the same way about something like TikTok. Um, TikTok can be a great thing, but it's really about how am I going to target my local people, right? Instagram, you can do that a little easier with because you can tag places and um, you can use hashtags, like certain hashtags for your town, et cetera. Um, yeah, but the other stuff was kind of hit and miss. Um, again, 99% of my marketing is done offline um, and just really like connecting with people. Um, yep, yeah, I agree, Roxanne. A lot of apps are out there now that people can just take off their watermark, which is so frustrating, but true, unfortunately. Okay, so moving on. Um, I was going to briefly talk about digital marketing, which is anything online um, or in the digital space. So this is where I think you're best spent with digital marketing is content marketing, which is creating valuable and relevant content that can be done via your blog or it can be done via a newsletter or it can be done via social media or whatever. It can be repurposed. That's the great thing about it. So like <clears throat> in my case, we'll do um, I'll create a blog post which I'll then send in a newsletter and say, hey, check out my newest blog post about this thing, right? And then at some point I can post on social media and say, check out this blog post about this thing or give like the three main points of that blog post uh, with a photo. I think the biggest thing with content marketing is making sure that you know why you're doing it and what you hope to get out of each piece. So it could just be to provide education and to connect or nurture the relationship. It could be because you're trying to get them to take some kind of action, such as booking a session or signing up on your mailing list or like whatever it may be. Um, or it could be you're just trying to engage with people and, and create a dialogue. Just know why you're doing it and don't just waste you know 24 hours a week on social media trying to post and get people to see you that's what I was going to say we have to remember there's millions of people waving like this on social media and so they we only have a split second to grab their attention and get them to stop on our posts and so that's why social media in general can be very difficult to market on but if you can do it the right way and have engaging content and be thoughtful about the content you're putting out there, you have a better chance. Um, yeah, so basically leverage that platform for engagement, try and create a dialogue back and forth and really consider what it is you hope to get out of that social media post that you're putting out there. Um, and then email marketing, I think that's one of the best ways to nurture leads and build relationships um, through email. You can even embed videos in your email, which I really love. I have a few students who, are, who have done that um, where they just create a little video and then they've embedded it into their newsletter. They have like a couple written sentences and the rest is them chatting. Um, and I think that's adorable. Um, yeah. Or you can do like little behind the scenes moments, whatever. And then the biggest one, in my opinion, is search engine op optimization, which is improving online visibility um, and getting people to find you naturally through Google search. Moving on from there, we have traditional marketing, which is my preferred method. Um, using print media such as publications and newspapers, magazines and brochures. Um, or really any variety of print, uh, print media is going to work. Broadcast and media, TV and radio. I use the example, a few of my students have been able to go on their local um, news or uh, local radio stations and talk about what it is they're doing. Um, yeah, I've had actually, now that I'm thinking about it, quite a few students um, do it. And it's always turned out really great for them in terms of getting people to go to their sites, driving traffic and um, getting leads from those things that they can then nurture. So broadcast media, putting yourself out there, press releases, et cetera, um, events and sponsorships. So conferences, trade shows and partnerships, creating um, you know, events with other creatives in your area can also work or 
offering to photograph local events, offering to photograph, um, let's say, your kid's school. It could be any number of things where you're showing up. Partnerships is a huge one to me and uh, one that I've utilized quite a lot in the past. Um, and that is partnering up with other brands in the area you want to serve um, in order to yeah, get business. So like in my case, I was partnering up with um, a, I'm trying to think of the word in English, gynecologist <laughs> for birth photography. Um, and I did that by having some of my birth photos, none of the below the belt birth photos, mostly of like baby coming out, nursing, whatever. Um, and um, I also have an album in the office, as well as my cards and a pamphlet and a few other things so that those patients that go see the doctor um, know that they can book me for birth, birth photography. And then the last one I have on here, which is one that is highly underutilized, but can be a lot of fun, is using direct mail. And I'm not talking like some cheap cheapo mailer thing that you put out. But if you really want to put yourself out there and, and especially if people don't know you exist at all, showing up in their mailbox, their physical mailbox, which um, the piece of mail won't be missed, right? So like in, a, in an email inbox, there's a chance that it could go to spam. There's a chance that they get 100 emails a day and they won't see it. There's like a lot of chances that it could be messed. Whereas with a physical piece of mail that you're just putting out there saying, hi, I'm so-and-so. These are like, here's a bit of my work. Um, contact me or check out my website or whatever the call to action is that you want them to do. Um, I think that would be a great way to let people know you exist. Okay, before I move on to that, any questions? Okay, so Allison asked here, do you have a standard offer that you use in your marketing? I found that people need a reason to take action and putting off family photography is too easy. Um, I agree, putting off family photography is too easy. Um, for me, it's going to depend. So when I'm creating my, um, I try and create a marketing calendar for the following year, every November is when I start doing it. I should probably start trying to do it earlier. But November through February is when I'm not working or taking as many clients on. And so I'm working a lot on my business during those months. Um, in Germany, it's really cold and really dark and really depressing. Um, I'm sure maybe I'm the only one that feels that way. The Germans are probably used to it. But I, I am not. And so those are the months that I don't do a whole lot of work with clients um, I'm mostly working on what I will do in my business for the following year. And during that time, I am um, putting my marketing plan together. And in that case, I'm deciding, okay, what kind of campaigns or promotions do I want to offer through the year? And that could be um, making sure to show up in my previous clients' um, mailboxes or email inboxes and say, hey, I have a promotion special for you. Um, it could be a reminder to them like, hey, don't forget, get your family photos. It's been a year, like whatever it, it could be. It doesn't even have to be a discount necessarily. It could just be a, a reminder showing up or like a thinking of you or whatever, right? Um, so the, the biggest standard that I offer in my marketing or thing I do consistently is I mail birthday cards to my clients. Um, and that keeps me on the top of their mind because I'm showing up in their mailbox again. Um, and they're like, oh, you know, there's Ash. That's right, we got a book session. Um, so that's one of the biggest ones. And then I will do, um, God, I just don't do a whole lot of promotion for like new clients at this point. I used to, I used to do um, giveaways, like, you know, book a session, now and get a portrait session, that type of thing um, as an add-on for free. Um, I My biggest promo would be when I was very first starting to try and pull in clients, offering a promotional rate or discounted rate off of my fees so that they could try my services. Um, I also did that a lot with portfolio building. I wasn't charging for portfolio building. But I would, ask, blah, blah, blah. I would ask them to recommend me or refer me to their friends. And in that case, I would give them like a free print for every referral since 
they weren't getting a physical product necessarily with the portfolio building. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, most, I will be honest, most of my standard marketing is all based on referral um, and repeat client marketing at this point. But like I said, previously, it would be promo rate, uh, like a special rate for new clients. Um, it was even, I was trying to figure out my groove of like, what's my, my sweet spot for sessions. And I really wanted to, and I still love doing four hour sessions. It's my favorite. And so for a long time, I was promoing four hour sessions with um, additional free print. Um, but yeah, you just have to think about, I also did like Christmas market sessions one year. It was like, God, probably 2016. It's been a long time. 17, maybe. But uh, we have Christmas markets in Germany, and I had a promotion to, you know, meet people at the Christmas market and photograph their family hanging out there. Um, and I did it at a prom promoted rate. Uh, that was fun. But like I said, it's been a long time. Uh, next question was, how do you do physical mailing exactly, or what would you recommend? Um, I would print some kind of postcard and have like a really great image on it. And then on the back, um, you know, some information about your website or you, or like just a little quick note, hi, et cetera. And um, for friends in this neighborhood, I'm offering X, Y, and Z, whatever your promo could be. Um, yeah, something simple. A lot of times marketing is not about overthinking it. It's just about taking action. Like I said before, you do want to think about what you're doing. You don't want to just like be throwing things at the wall and hoping they stick. But one thing that you also don't want to do is overthink something so much that you don't take action. And I know I do it myself. Um, I will start researching and researching and researching something and planning it. And then I just don't do anything with it because I get overwhelmed by the actual step I need to take or steps. I've created it too big in my mind. So a lot of times it's making the decision and we'll talk about that in the next um, little spot. Um, you could definitely get um, addresses through the questionnaire. So like for me, any client, sorry, I'm just reading off of a question in the chat here. Um, all of my clients that get a session with me, I get their home address. Obviously I'm going to their home address 99% of the time anyway. And I also ask about the birth dates of the family. And um, and then I just keep a monthly um, accordion file, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. And I have all of the cards I need to mail that month um, in the accordion and I pull them out and I stick them in the mailbox and they're done. Um, like I said, keep it simple. Let's see. And then as far as like just putting stuff in mailboxes, you can literally, you don't even have to post it. You can just stick things in people's mailbox, right? Like, I don't know, hire some teenager, pay him a couple bucks an hour, not a couple, but I don't know. I don't want to get in charge for like child labor or something, <laughs> but, but um, send kids out there and have them stick your promos in people's mailboxes. Okay. I think I got I have a friend who's a realtor and she said she did door hangers. Yeah. And she actually hired my oldest to go around different neighborhoods and just do door hangers. I don't legally in the US, I don't know if you can stick it in somebody's mailbox. I was gonna just say that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it on the door. <laughs> you yep. can just stick it. I mean, we get in California, we get like landscaping business. I was gonna say like you get I remember in California getting the rocks in the driveway, like the little bag of rocks to show like gravel options. Oh, we yeah. don't get that here, but that's brilliant. Yeah, they would like bag up a little bag of rocks of like, you know, landscaping rocks. Sure, sure. I think the legality of it is that you can't put things inside someone else's mailbox. That's Correct. the, okay. so you could hang it on their mailbox, you can hang it on their door, but the post box itself is like a government. Hey, Sacred yeah, it's considered mail tampering. It's a federal offense. Uh, okay. It's goofy, but it is what it is. Yeah. All right. So X A on the having kids put things in people's mailbox, maybe tie it to a rock and throw it on the lawn. <laughs> Um, the door hangers are perfectly fine. You you definitely could do the door hangers, no okay. problem. Another so. thing I've seen people uh, physically do or heard about people doing is sticking, and I don't know, like 
you have to decide how ballsy you want to be with this stuff. But um, creating like bookmarks and going into the bookstore where like like the expectant mothers section for like birth photography. Um, yeah, for birth photography and like sticking your birth photography thing into the bookmark, like the bookmark into the expecting. Ugh, God, I did a horrible job at explaining this. <laughs> Creating a bookmark with your information and for like expectant mothers, right? Going to that section of the bookstore and putting your a bookmark in a bunch of those books um, that says like your information, you're glowing, book me to photograph you blasting that baby out. <laughs> um, yeah, just some ideas. Yeah, I know in Germany, you're allowed to stick things in mailboxes as long as there's not a sticker that like, we have to specifically have a sticker that says no advertising on our mailbox we have to have it on there. Otherwise, people throw a bunch. We we have the sticker and people still throw a bunch of stuff in our small box. Uh, anyways, okay, moving on. Last thing I, I want to talk question. about. Oh, yeah, go I'm ahead. In this area, um, you were talking about um, collaboration and partnerships. Yeah. Um, as a way to get yourself out there. Um, I do a lot of stuff in kind of social justice um, space, and I'm wondering a little bit about how do I protect my work um, from being like just given and distributed forever um, when I share in a collaboration. Um, I'm not sure if this is like directly a marketing question, it's more like um how do i put boundaries on uh my work when i am doing it in a kind of get the word out sort of way well so you can still have um agreements that you have people sign um, okay give me one second hold on Okay, sorry. Um, I knew one of the kids would bust in at some point. <laughs> so yeah, I would definitely have make sure even if you're doing work for free, you should always have an agreement in place. So um, collaborate, uh, cal collaboration agreement, as well as the boundaries of what the terms of use for those photographs are. So if it's okay. a casual loops, meaning they can use it forever, or um, where they can use it, can they use it in print? print media, can they use it on social media, et cetera, and uh, what that looks like. We have an agreement on the DFE education site that is for um, like project type work. Um, so dfpeducation.com and then just go into shop. And there should be something that says like um, projects, agreement of understanding or memorandum, memoran I can't say that word, memorandum, no, you know. Um, some kind Memorandum. Of, something like that of understanding. Um, these were drafted by a lawyer, by the way, um, from Washington, mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. So um, and he created something for us. And I think in that it includes some information about how stuff can be used. And that includes usage on your site as well. So then finding like a model release if you needed. Great. That um that helps a lot because i've been finding myself a little bit rudderless um in terms of how to do that and not yeah. wanting to be um you know like overly boundaried about it but right. i had my photos printed in a way that i didn't like um and um and then suggested that they be used in a way that I didn't like. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of figure that out for myself in the yeah. future. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's important to do. And that goes for everyone. Even if you're doing a portfolio shoot, you should have an agreement in place so that there's an understanding on both sides. So whether it's a project, a personal project you're doing or portfolio building or anything else, you would you need um, to have in place the expectations for both parties. Um, that way there's no surprises and, you know, it's really easy to refer back to that. And, you know, if something comes up and you want to bend on what is in that agreement, you always can, but at least you have it in place to cover you in all other areas. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm overly cautious going the other direction, like making sure that there's permission for children or, um, you know, where I could post it. I could, <laughs> I err on the side of never sharing anything <laughs> right, right. So, I, don't, I don't share anything either really yeah so that's kind of damaging for me but yeah yeah um, no I think that's that's a great question great. thanks for asking thank you I really appreciate that sure thing okay anybody else okay moving on so the last little part here I wanted to talk about is like how um Marketing campaigns and plans work, and they actually uh, work the same way or similar ways. And just a brief overview of the difference between marketing plans and campaigns. Plans, marketing plans are something that you can utilize over and over and, um, you know, are persistent for a very long time. Whereas the campaign is going to be like a short burst of something. So I'll just give an example. A campaign for me was me putting out that, hey, I have this free marketing course coming up, right? I, I created the graphics for that. I put it out. But once it's once this is done, like that's it for this free mentoring or yeah, free marketing mentoring, right? I'm not going to like campaign it again, even though it's it's over. Um, I guess I could reuse it. I could be like try and resell the replay or something, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so the idea is, is plans is something that can, um, is used for a long time and can be used over and over um, and is planned for the future, et cetera, and um, doesn't necessarily have, um, you know, special messaging that's specific to a campaign or a promo about Mother's Day um, that would have very specific messaging about mothers. Okay, so, but the, the way they work is the same. And that is that ideally all you're doing is having a look at what it is you want to do and what you want to accomplish um, and working backwards, really. So like for me, the way this works is I come up with, okay, what do I hope to accomplish in 2024, right? I'm looking at this. I'm like, okay, I want to, um, make sure that I establish my existing clients are coming back to me because like I said, after COVID that dropped off quite a bit, whereas I used to have like six months out booked in advance. Now I'm not that far out booked in advance. It's not um, as it was. So I want to make sure to get back to that point. I'm going to just use this as an example. Um, so what can I do in order to get back to that point? And so I'm going to, that's, um, what I'm looking at, I'm going to analyze what's my current situation. My current situation is I have this list of clients that I've worked with in the past that used to come to me every year or every other year. And um, then COVID happened and that fell off. And so now I need to get them back in to coming every year or every other year. I need to understand what my industry is looking like. Um, yeah, what other photographers are doing and um, where I can fill in the market if there's like any certain places that the market is lacking something. And then I need to decide who my target audience is. So I already decided my target audience is my previous clients that I've, I've already worked with. That's who I'm gonna be targeting with these plans as well as creating campaigns that will work for them. From there, I created, I'll create my goals and objectives. So in my case, I like to create goals that um, are, I don't know if you've heard of SMART goals, but they're really specific goals, right? So I'm like, I want to make sure I get at least 10 repeat clients in 2024. And I want them booked by May 2024 through the end of the year or whatever it is. 
And then I have on here also, what are my key performance indicators? What those mean are, what can I look at to tell me if my marketing and my campaigning and my plans I'm putting into place are working? Whether What are the points in time that I can say, yes, this is working? It seems like people are getting on track with this or wait a minute, I need to pivot and do something else. What can those key performance indicators be? From there, I need to create a quick strategy. So like an overall approach um, for how I'm going to do this and what kind of compelling compelling messages I need to um, you know, have on here. So for me, with, uh, for example, with a plan, that's something I can utilize year, year after year. Maybe I come up with a compelling message that I'm going to use over and over again throughout various dif different pieces of marketing or content. But with a campaign, I might come up with something else in addition to that, right? So um, I'm creating an overall strategy of what it's going to look like, um, how I'm going to be showing up. Then I'm going to make tactics and to-do lists. So what, what kind of calendar do I need to put in place? Do I need to put in place deadlines? Um, what kind of resources or other people do I need to hire on to help me? Do I need to put out a press release, for example? Um, do I need to hire a graphic designer or copywriter? Um, is there a follow-up system I need to put in place? Meaning, okay, so what happens when someone does take action on this? How do I contact them back? Or what it is, what is it that I need to do? Is there a landing page I need to create on my website, for example? And then from there, I take action. So I start implementing all of these things. I create my campaign or my marketing pieces. And then I follow my deadlines, my checklist, and I launch. And I start doing all of these activities I have on there, right? Sending out my newsletter, showing up at this special festival in town, um, contacting and letting them know about the promotion that I'm giving a free extra hour for every session that they book. Um, you know, offering yeah, whatever, full day in the life sessions uh, for extended family this time or whatever it may be, right? And then you take control or a control or a look at um, how things went. So you track how much money you spent, how much time you spent, what the outcomes of each of your uh, activities were, and you evaluate the performance and make sure or make any changes that you need to. So pivot as accordingly, um, or like in some cases, it might be, well, that was a huge flop. I need to figure something else out. I actually might need to go and start knocking on people's door and be like, do you remember me? Um, that could be my marketing campaign. So that's basically how they work. Again, starting with an idea or a goal of what you have in mind. What do I want to do? I want people to know I exist. Okay, how am I going to do that? Um okay, I'm going to, by April 2024, make sure that I've had at least 100 new visitors to my website. Okay, so what does that mean? I need to get my website in order. I need to have my branding in place. I need to have my pricing structure in, in place so that in case someone asks me about it, I know what to do, blah, 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 blah. And it goes from there and you create tax it, tactics. Um, yeah, does that make sense? This is just like, like I said, an overview of it. Here's the thing with marketing. I could talk about marketing for like probably nine days in a row. You would all be sleeping, but um, it could still be good. <laughs> um, there's so many things to do with marketing. This is just like an overview of how it all looks and the things you can do to get started with it. The main thing, like I said, is to start um, making sure you have your branding in place, your pricing in place, all of those things need to be um, set up in case someone does, you know, contact you, you need to have it ready to go, as well as I highly suggest that workflow for clients um, in place so that you know what to do what, each time a client comes that you can deliver that great experience. Um, yeah. Any questions about that? I see that there's some questions in the chat, so I'm going to answer those as well, but um, if anyone wants to unmute, they can while I'm pulling those up. Okay, so any ideas about how to market documentary family photography in an area that does not have any? Um, so you, documentary, blah, 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 blah. 
<laughs> documentary, marketing, documentary, family photography in an area that doesn't have any is actually something really special because you're not having to compete that hard. Um, there's a few more in my area that have popped up in the beginning. I was the only one that I knew of. Same with birth photography. I was like the only one. And so I had the corner on the market and I didn't have to do a whole lot to try and differentiate myself. Um, now, of course, I have to work harder. You should always, you know, make sure you have something there. But in my case, I was like, wow, this isn't so bad. Um, so really use that to your advantage. But biggest things are going to be really portfolio build. Make sure you have things on your website website that show exactly what you do. Nothing that is varying from that, that people could get confused by it. Now, if you do offer, let's say you offer documentary, but also some kind of portrait or lifestyle, you want to have those in two completely separate areas on your website. So there is no confusion of what you offer, the different session types. Um, yeah, and so to start out, like I said, I would make sure to start portfolio building, get at least five good portfolio builds. I, I mean, I would say 20, but that might overwhelm you. So I'll say five good portfolio builds under your belt um, and start asking for feedback on those, asking for referral um, and figuring out how you can show up with that. Don't forget, you can always do like Facebook ads and um, um Instagram sponsorships and blah, blah, blah. You can do all those things as well. But I would highly suggest getting out into your community instead. From there, I after getting those portfolio builds done, I would try and connect with some businesses. See if you can photograph maybe someone in the business that can then give a true testimonial to your uh, work and how you work when their clients or their customers come into their business location and say, oh, you know, try this photographer, right? <clears throat> There's lists and lists and tons of different people that you can partner with. I, the ideas are endless. You can uh, do realtors. <laughs> That's one. Um, and when someone buys a house, every time someone buys a house, they get a, a gift certificate to a session with you, for example. Um, you can do yoga studios, you can do gynecologists, you can do um, kids music classes, schools. I have a literally a list of like over 100 of different places you can connect with. You just have to be creative with it and think about where people are showing up. Um, that might want this, right? And then any tools or software I use to help me track uh, campaigns. <laughs> I'm kind of old school. So I use, um, to track my campaigns, I use spreadsheet. Um, I'm sure there are like a hundred different better softwares out there to do that. Um, it's just what I have been doing for so long and I'm not really good with change. <laughs> um, I still use a paper calendar and notebook. Um, so if that tells you anything. Um, but yeah, that's the the biggest thing. Um, yeah, you can definitely use, oh, for like a CRM for tracking, um, I highly suggest, um, God, why is my right? Sprout Studio. I can also, when I send the recording with the email, I can also put a discount code for Sprout in there. Sprout is great for, they also have newsletter campaigns, they have galleries, they have um, album proofing, they have all of that kind of stuff in there as well. Um, Sprout Studio is great. Let's see, I'm trying to think of anything else. Yeah. Um, I think that was it for the questions on the chat. And then I was just gonna give you a quick recap. I'm sorry, this has been, um, I haven't tried Dubsado. I see people um, like it, but yeah, I've never tried it. So I can't give honest feedback. So real quick recap is the strategy, uh, marketing is the strategy you use for getting your target market to know you, like you, and trust you enough to become a client so you can solve their problems, meet their needs, create impact in their life. Um, core components of marketing are brand, messaging, product service, pricing, target audience, and channels. Um, marketing helps you create brand awareness, generate leads and bookings, establish and maintain uh, client relationships. The three phases of marketing, marketing are to know, like, and trust. Uh, the marketing mix 
includes products and services, place, price, and promotion. Um, you're going to make sure to utilize both digital and traditional marketing strategies and always start with the end in mind and uh, or your hope for, hoped for outcome. Think of that first when you start creating your plans for marketing um, or campaigns, that kind of thing. Um, really quick, I had some questions. Um, oh, what questions do you have? Oops, I accidentally. So that's the first thing. And then I had some questions from the Facebook group. I'm just gonna look at them here really quick. I'm gonna go over them while you all think of your questions or type your questions. Why do I keep doing that? I gotta close that for a minute. Um, someone had asked, I'd like to talk about packaging documentary sessions over a year, like a growing family or growing baby session every three months-ish. Um, so in particular with packaging those types of sessions, you're going to have to decide a few things. One, what is it including? Is, are the sessions going to include um, the photos with it or is it like they're paying for the sessions and then at the end they purchase all of the photos at the end? Um, you know, what, what is it going to include, exclude, what is offered, that type of thing. Um, and then of course, the biggest thing will be since they are booking a quarterly session or uh, a monthly session or whatever it is, obviously they would get some kind of discount for booking that amount of sessions at once and signing on for that. Um, pricing and packaging for it is going to vary. It's going to depend on a few things. One, um, obviously what you need to earn in order to, to make sense for you um, to actually turn a profit with it. Um, in addition to that is um, how much of your business it actually makes up. So I know for some people, their entire business is based on these types of, of sessions um, where they do like year long type projects with families or quarterly projects. And um, so they take on, let's say 10 families a year that do this and that's it. They don't have to do anything else and they're all set. Um, so it's, it's really hard for me to give like exact numbers um, without, yeah, knowing what your need to earn numbers are, as well as what your hopes are for your business. Um, but packaging them up as a way to do it, um, again, things that there's going to be no right or wrong answer here, but the things to consider with it are, do you want to do like an ordering appointment or deliver the photos each time after the session, like, you know, every three months, or is it going to be a total thing at the end of the year? So that's one question I'd ask myself. Um, number two is, does the session include digital files, an album? Um, you know, like what does it include? And yeah, those are the two things I'd start out. Oh, and then also estimate how much time you think each of these things would take. So how many hours is each session every three months? Is it one hour, two hour, four hour, six? Um, and then how much time does it take you to edit them and do the com communication back and forth? So I'd figure out kind of my hourly rate for that. And I price probably based on that with a slight discount. Um, there's a really good course on this um, written by Lip uh, Ben Lipford in the DFP Education Library. Um, if you go on the dfpeducation.com website and then you go under... Good. I can't remember. I think it's uh, workshops or learning or something like that. You'll be able to find the DFP education library and it's 20 euro a month. It's really inexpensive for access to a bunch of different classes. And that's one of them that are on there. Um, I'd love to talk about specific items that are in the contract related to the documentary, uh, documentary like standing on furniture, taking care of kids, if their parents are away, uh, just causes or mention specific to the documentary. I'll come back to that one in a second because I'll just show you the DFP contract um, information that we have. And then ideas about partnering with other businesses to reach different groups. So I already pretty much touched on this. The way I would do it is make a huge list of all the, the businesses or uh, brands or creatives, et cetera, that you want to collaborate with um, or partner with. Pick your top three and then really work on the nurturing that relationship with them. Again, that's a, like partnership marketing is a whole nother um, I could do like a whole nother course on it. It's part of the year-long program 
the ins and outs of it, as well as like the contracts you use or the agreement, you should always have an agreement with your partnerships, a written agreement um, and what that looks like. But basically it's gonna be about creating a relationship with them um, asking them for a partnership or if they're interested in collaborating in some way, figuring out what it is you can do for them. That is extremely, extremely important. So it's not just a one-way street. And then really nurturing that relationship as well. Um, I also like to offer my partners a free documentary session so that they understand what it is. Um, it's really important to me that they're not feeling like, okay, I don't really know what this thing is that I'm like telling my customers that they should do. Um, okay, so next one, I'd like to hear about, hear other people's two sentence catchphrase or byline when they're asked what documentary photography is and what I do, uh, things that are not too cliche. So um, again, I touched on this in that everyone should be different, right? Everyone should be different based on their brand and what it is that they want to do for clients and create create value in their lives as well as impact in their life. Um, so, I mean, we can always come up with the phrase of like uh, the, the simple byline or phrase of um, unposed photography or, um, you know, I always tell people, well, I just come and document your life exactly as you are, but that's not really what I do. I do so much more than that for them, right? So, and that's going to be a per personal situation to me as, this is what I'm drawn to documenting for these reasons. And this is what I wanna show you with my photos. And it's gonna be different for every person, hopefully. Um, if I hear you say that it's about documenting the beauty of your everyday life, your no, the beauty of your everyday mundane, um, I'm going to screech really loud because that's what everyone says. And no one's allowed to say it anymore. I want you to be different. It's a beautiful sentiment, but everybody says it. And so why should anyone care anymore? Sorry, I know that sounded harsh. Um, I should think about how I say things, but I, I want, my goal with this is that you all start thinking about like, yeah, we do that, but what else do we do? Why? Like, why does that become important, right? Like, why? Tell me more. Um, so that's my suggestion for you. Ask yourself why, why is that important? Um, and then how to get clients with when first starting out, we covered that. Um, how to market to people that are vacationing in my area. Um, I would try and connect with vacation rentals in your area and see if you can put up some promos and flyers or, you know, offers into their vacation rentals, um, as well as advertising it on your website with SEO or on a directory, that type of thing. Um, yeah. And then how to set up relationships with business who refer clients to me. Again, we address that. And then making sure that you have something that you can give uh, clients who book, right? So uh, through that business. So having a two-way exchange. Okay. I think that was it there. I will, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and I'm going to look. Did I read somewhere that if you, we've signed up for the year-long seminar, we get a discount for uh, the DFP library. The DFP library is, okay, sorry. The year-long mentoring program has a free DFP membership, like directory listing and membership, which um, is, you know, connecting to the community and like some other education events and our awards and a couple of other things. It's different than the library, but there is a discount code for the library that makes it only seven euro a month. And right now the library is um, um, free to try, I think, for 14 days, or I can set it to free to try. If you all want to try it, you can. I'll set it free to try for seven days. How about that? Because 14 days is what we do for Black Friday. Uh, give me a second and I'll put the, I'm going to add some links for you all so you can um, actually see what I'm talking about. Uh, and then give me a second and I'll set up the seven day free trial for you all to look at those classes if you want. Oops, if I could find my Zoom, that'd be amazing. Um, everyone in meeting. So that's the DFP Education Library. And then this is 
uh, Jenna Schuldeis in my year long mentoring course. And then I was going to show you also really quickly what the contracts look like. So I'm going to share my screen really quick. Um, one and oh, nope, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so this is the dfp.com, uh, dfpeducation.com uh, shop. And this is where the um, contracts are. There's one for the EU, which includes like a pr privacy policy, and then one for everywhere else that doesn't need that extra privacy policy. Um, so this is the normal one, and then the EU one includes just one extra sheet or clause in there about the privacy policy. So what's included in this, um, this just so you know, this is written <laughs> in a way that I think is hysterical. I wrote this pre-AI, um, but some people might not. Someone actually complained to us about it. So um, yeah, anyways, you'll hear why in a minute. So the DFP um, client agreement or contract includes the ins and outs of the session details. So when, where, and for how long with whom. Uh, session fees, ad, um, additional costs, like if you need a permit for shooting in certain locations or them to cover your ticket to Disneyland or travel. Um, payment, how they can pay you is there, um, what's included in the session fee. Um, and then this is all customizable for you, of course. Um, cancellation and rescheduling pro, pro, uh, the, the policy. Operating procedural procedures, like how things are going to go down. You're going to chat with them in your pre-consultation before the session takes place. Um, or, you know, like educating them basically that documentary family photography isn't about you posing them, right? So that's all in there. Also, it talks about things like being covered in case of bad lighting or missed moments. Or if heaven forbid your camera takes a dump and stops working, um, you'll be covered in the case of having to stop the session or leave due to a rabid chicken or any other animal or human being being a dick. Um, copyright and client image use is in there. Image file and delivery. How are you getting them their images? Um, yeah, do you do it in person or via online gallery? Archiving and editing. So how, like what your archive policy is as well as um, to not edit or not to edit images how you see fit, as well as scoldings for any clients who put a filter on, um, a data policy, a limited, of, limited use of liability. So things like you're not a babysitter, kids safety stuff. And if you climb on a chair and to get a different perspective and the chair breaks, you're covered. And then all of the usual stuff. So model release, step-by-step -step instructions on how to customize the agreement, et cetera. Um, yeah. So, I can add that into there. I hope that helps. But basically, I think the main things for DFP sessions are that we have no control of the lighting um, or how things are going to turn out. Sometimes we have to have really high S ISO. Um, we're not babysitters. So, um, you know, if like we can't be responsible if our kid gets hurt. Um, what else? We can't be responsible for climbing up on things and breaking it. Anything like that, you know, the usual. Um, basically the way we created the contract was we got with a lawyer in Washington, DC, who's amazing. And we asked the community, what are things that you have ran into during a documentary session that you think should be covered in a contract? And we had him put all of that in there. Um, actually, yeah, I can... If anyone actually, what I'll do is I'll create you all, I'll put it in the email, but I'll create you all a discount code um, for, like I said, there's going to be a discount code for the Smart Slides and Smart Albums, Sprout Studio. Um, I'll do the 14 or no, seven day for trial for people who want to look at the library. And then this, I'll do a small discount code for uh, the contract. Yes, the other thing is there is a bonus. Um, for anyone who signs up with the year-long mentoring program, the bonus is includes the 500 euro off right now, a year membership on DFP um, listing, as well as like the membership, with, what goes along with that. Um, I can link that too, so you can see what I'm talking about. And then you can also choose a free con contract of your choice. 
um, from the DFP education shop. And does anyone have any other questions? I feel like I'm just yakking away here. I always black out for a minute. <laughs> I love seeing your face, Diana. You make me feel right at home. <laughs> okay. Diana's used to me because she spent a year with me. She just finished the the uh, No More Effing Around program with Jenna and I. And um, it changed her life. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> I will say, like, I, I, there was no agreement for me to come on here and say anything, but I no, will say if anyone's even considering it, like, it's, it's so amazing. Like, the, it's so much work. It's exhausting. I feel like I've aged, like, 20 more years just from all the work. Say but, nice you, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so good. It's so much information. And, like, all the stuff that Ash can answer for you, like, out of the top of her head. Because you're like, hey, Ash, I have this question. Like, she does it all year long. And then you have the one-on-ones with her. Like, it's it's been it's been amazing. So, you. not getting paid. Although, no. Ash, would like to, you know, give me something. But I will. So your 10% manager fee. Yay. <laughs> but no, seriously, like just really, really, really well worth it. Thank you. Yes, everyone follow each other on Instagram. Um, Show me. Oh, my son has his, he's under my desk right now on a, and he said, follow him too. He also has an Instagram account. He's 10, by the way. He, he just creates, um, model model airplanes and stuff and post them on there using my phone um anyway does anyone have questions Do, am i missing any let's see i don't think i am wait did i read no nope that's a different one okay like i said what i will do is um, I will send out an email with the replay to this tomorrow, I think. And then I will um, include the information, links, et cetera, that I talked about here as well. I'm trying to think if there's a way to include the chat. I, there is. I'll include the chat file. I'm just trying to think how to embed it because it always embeds a little weird. That way you all can have each other's Instagram uh, handles and yeah it's been good I guess it did take me 120 minutes a little longer sorry y'all I tried to keep it short but good all right thank you all so much it was really fun and um I'm sorry if I I um, lost you at any point. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, you can email or message me or, you know, however you want to get in touch. I'll be here as usual. <laughs> as always, just here on Zoom. <laughs> just kidding. Um, good. And I'll see what other kind of classes I can put together for you, you soon, too. Um, I know some people were asking about when I did the voting of what you want to learn about pricing, et cetera. Um, pricing was one of them. So I'll see about trying to put something together for that too. Um, yeah. I'm glad it was worth the 120 minutes, Renee. That makes me happy. I'm glad I can see the people are still awake whose faces I can see. Now the ones off camera, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Good. Like I said, join me for the year long, me and Jenna, and I'll, I'll include the some of the, um, if you missed the previous free education things, I'll include links to that too. Jenna and I did a few earlier this month. Thank you all. Have a good Wednesday. Thank you, Ash. Thanks. Bye. What now, Mom?